Hi everyone, welcome to day four of the Disruptive Innovation Festival, the online festival of ideas that ask, what if we could redesign everything? My name is Alex, and it's my pleasure today to have Nitsan Harman to tell us about design for artificial intelligence, augmentation, and language. I'm gonna be your voice today, so for any questions you might have for Nitsan, please ask them below this video, on the YouTube video, or hashtag thinkdiff on Twitter. Nitsan is going to tell us about artificial intelligence and the future of communication with machine. So now is my time to pass it on to Nitsan. We're going to have a, a talk of about 25 to 30 minutes, after which there's going to be a dedicated Q&A. So please make sure you send all your questions through. Hi, Nitsan. It's my pleasure to have you today, and I'll pass it over to you now. Hi, Alex. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, and thanks for the invitation. I'm glad to be a part of this. I'm just going to share my screen so I can start my presentation. So today I want to talk about design for AI augmentation and language and the power of creative questioning as we are getting into new paradigms of using machines and artificial intelligence and, and machine learning and all of those new technologies we hear a lot about. So before we start, I just want to um, give ourselves a basic schema to even think about how do we communicate with machines today. So I want us to think about everyday situations where we go around and use our, uh, Twitter or Facebook. In essence, we use a machine. On the one hand, uh, there's a human, that's us. And on the other, there's a machine. Um, the machine extends itself through computation into a tool. And the human extends, we extend ourselves using mental models to use that tool. So for example, if I use uh, Wikipedia, then the machine extends itself through a website into a tool. That's where we meet. And then me as a human need to go to a computer and, and uh, type in Wikipedia and find what, I, what I'm looking for. So the artificial intelligence way of looking at this using that schema is putting intelligence in machines, completely overpassing the interface point, and coming to humans with utility. So you can think about um, what that means in kind of uh, maybe if, if a robot would just roll next to you like ET and would uh, make you coffee and also make your website. So there's less this idea of tools and interface points. It's just this embodiment of intelligence that could you know, just render utility. But that raises a question of um, the brain and how can we really create um, human-like thinking in a computer. And to think about that, I want to uh, um, talk about two um, main thinkers. Some might say the fathers of the field, uh, John McCarthy and Marvin Minsky, uh, who started MIT's AI lab in uh, 1959. So John McCarthy once said, you can either look at computing AI from the point of view of biology or from the point of view of computer science. You could imitate the nervous system as far as you understand the nervous system, or you could imitate human psychology as far as you understand human psychology. So there's real, there's kind of real sentiment of, of trying to map um, the brain as, as some sort of a, trying to map the operation of the brain, let's say, and trying to see how can we approach it. And you know, maybe bringing it back to uh, today, biology uh, means neural nets, which we might have all heard about. Those are, those are computer networks that operate the same way that neurons operate in the brain uh, by, by kind of um, touching uh, clusters of logic that are in proximity to each other. And the idea of psychology is the idea of buckets of knowledge. The other person uh, that we talk about, as I mentioned, is Marvin Minsky. And he once said, in order for a machine to be intelligent, we have to give it several different kinds of thinking. When it switches from one of those to another, we would say that it is changing emotions. Emotion in itself is not a very profound thing. It's just a switch between different modes of operation. So again, there's this idea that you can almost peer down at, intelli at intelligence and kind of try and, 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 re and create it. You can kind of say, you know what, I got this. I can create it with a computer. 
that's a very different mode than uh, what intelligent augmentation speaks about, which uh, in intelligent augmentation, we look at how can we move the machine operation closer to the way uh, that humans think and humans' mental models, and by that, just alleviate the cognitive load on the human. So in a nutshell, machine operations that are more human-friendly, intuitive to use, and use our intelligence as opposed to trying to mimic it. Under this camp, I'll talk about two thinkers also from the same era, uh, Dal Gengelbart from the Stanford Institute for Human Augmentation uh, and Alan Kay. Doug Engelbart once said, the better we get at getting better, the faster, the faster we will get better. Even though it's a bit of a mouthful to say, the sentiment is very different because if before we kind of peered down at intelligence, now we're kind of looking up, up at it and realizing, you know what, I can't really compute it, but I'm going to try and work with it. Similarly, Alan Kay, uh, who at the time worked at Xerox Park, uh, said, Reality is a reconstruction based on our beliefs of the world. It is that reconstruction that allows for theatrical performance. And it was understanding that user interface is theater that advanced us. So again, a very, very different um, point of view. And this is probably the, the first reference we have to um, uh, in this talk and probably at the time for um, for mental models and, and human bias or human perception as they relate to the usage of tools. And I just want to I want to follow Alan Kay's uh, trajectory and, and walk because it really tells us a lot about um, how human interact with tools and we can still feel it today in more ways than we, we could understand. So at the time uh, Alan Kay built um, this this device that's um, called the DynaBook, which is kind of a mix of a laptop and an iPad, and it's used for early education for kids. It's a software, Smalltalk, was meant to be user-friendly and intuitive and use a graphic interface, but at the time there wasn't any server architecture that could use it. So Alan Kay invited um, Trig Rinkskog, a Finnish computer scientist, and together with Adele Goldberg, they came up with Model View Controller, um, which was uh, ingenious in the fact that it mapped human mental models to computational behavior. And then in the middle, we, um, we have our tool, which is essentially made out of the controller, which is the actual function, and the view, which is the interface point. With time, model view controller kind of flattened out a bit, uh, but the core principles are still there. On the one hand, we have a computer model that's our database. Uh, on the other, we have the view, which could be an app or a website. And in the middle, we have a controller that, that runs back and forth between the two and relays what the user wants and then gets data and goes back and forth. So examples of this would be, uh, let's use Wikipedia again. The computer model would be a huge table with all of the different entries, the view would be uh, the Wikipedia website or the Wikipedia app, and controllers would go would go back and forth, as we said. So if I'm looking for, uh, for example, the Isle of Wight, then I would go to my view and type the Isle of Wight, and then the controller would go to the database and fetch the entry and bring it back to the view. Now, let's say I picked up on an arrow, and because, you know, obviously, uh, Wikipedia, you know, you can edit if something is wrong, then I would edit it, and then uh, the controller would propagate the change into our computer model. So that, in a nutshell, is what a model view controller uh, stands for. It was very uh, popular at the time, but it really, really, really exploded when um, the internet came, up, came, came about uh, and opened up in '93. But what's even more interesting to consider that uh, all of our all of our website, all of our tools and apps, um, all of the systems we use, all of the data we access, uses a model view controller or a very close mutation of it. And I want to talk about what that means and how um, how that shapes the way we interact with tools. So before we go into into kind of a, an example of what 
what model view controller actually uh, um, instills in the way we think about tools. I just want to take a second and talk about Taylorism. Uh, Taylor was um, kind of a management thinker in 1910, and he wrote a book called uh, Principles of Scientific Management. And at the time, we just started working in factories, and we really just had to optimize every step of the process, every step of the assembly line. So, so a manager would, you know, would go in and say, OK, step A takes me four seconds. I could probably improve it by doing this and then you know x i would i would if that would result in an increase of efficiency by y so i would i would argue and as you'll see i'll show an example that a lot of what we've been doing around model view controller is essentially digital tailorism it's this idea that we can constantly improve and optimize every step of a linear process going back and forth but there's some real, real provocations to that because, first of all, a lot of those systems run on data. And data, as we know, is not a zero-sum economy. Secondly, data is cheap. And making tools is becoming even cheaper, as we'll see. And thirdly, narrow AI, that is AI that just automates a single task, in a way gives assembly lines their own agency. So it's almost like the assembly line runs itself and kind of never ending, in a way, because there's, we never run of material. So let's hold on to that thought and now um, go through a case study. But first, let me read a quick, quick quote from Klaus Schwab, the founder of the uh, Davos World Economic Forum. The fact that the unit of wealth is created today with much fewer workers compared with 10 or 15 years ago is possible because dig digital businesses have marginal costs that tend towards zero. So again, I just wanted to reinforce this idea that, that making is becoming so much cheaper, yet we're thinking in a very industrialist uh, state of mind. So in a way, it's less about building new tools, but using our tools with a different uh, uh, mindset. So let's run through for an example. Uh, let's say that I want to start a, a company to track my bike rides or my, or my running, something similar to Strava or, or Nike running. So obviously, I'll need, a, I'll need a computer model. I need a database to keep all of my users' runs. I need a view, which would be uh, nice and intuitive and user-friendly and work on, on an iPhone and an Apple Watch and, and all of those nice things. And then I need controllers to communicate between the two and fetch what I, uh, fetch uh, information from the database and then propagate new runs of my users into the database. And they all communicate between each other, as we said. Now, what's very interesting to consider is that we can draw a line around that. And that's a business. That's my business. It's almost like a metaphysical island. You can say that that's an island. On my island, I've got my, my servers. I got my entry point that's nice and intuitive. And then I got controllers that run around my island and, and get data um, in and out from the view to the computer model. And whenever I want to get users on, they need to come onto my island and talk to the view. Now, I want to, I want to just uh, really be very explicit about why this system um, is about to, I wouldn't say run its course, but it's facing some, you know, where things are going in terms of, of the of the volumes of data that we operate with and where IoT is going. Um, we need to we need to start thinking about the system more explicitly. So uh, computer models are stationary. That is to say, all all of those systems, uh, MVC and likes. Um, operate on stationary databases. That is to say, you can think about the data almost like books on shelves. And maybe just to run for a quick thought experiment, you know, next time you finish a run, consider the fact that the data of your run, how much, how many miles you ran, how fast that was, your route, is all on your phone. If you could measure that, your phone would probably be nanograms heavier because of that data. But it's completely useless until it travels to a server and comes back. The second thing is that the view itself is proprietary. That is to say, every pixel of that interface point has been 
decided upon by um, by whoever designed it by the system. And that's also a problem because if you start considering developments, as I mentioned, in IoT, in Internet of Things, um, you know, and the fact that we soon be able to talk with rooms we walk into, keeping all of those system proprietary is going to be an issue. So because of that, I want to think about moving the fence. Um, and I want to see what does that what does that yield. So let's run with this for a second. So if we move the fence closer and we say the database is out of the fence because, hey, I got all of this data that's with me and I, I don't want it to travel, I want to use it now. And we also say, hey, I don't only want to use your proprietary interface point, I want to use, I want to, want to use your system in a truly interoperable way. I want to use, you know, I want to use your Strava um, um, running metrics special source system on my bike rides, on my runs, on on something that I track in a sensor in my shoe. So that really um, starts to promote the idea of the controller. So the controller kind of becomes this new goal because because really, if you if we're saying that that the database is is out of the fence and the view is out of the fence, now the controller is really this this kernel of the system. It's what what the, it's the crystallized articulation of what the system stands for. It's in another another way of thinking about it. It's both the function that the system performs and the purpose it was built for. And if before we were talking to um, to a view, now we can think about the controller coming and finding us. And to maybe illustrate what that means, I want to talk about plumbers for a second. And I want to talk about why plumbers are so different from Facebook or Twitter or any other system we use today. If you're, if you're in a city and you look outside the window and you see a building right now, you can probably think of that building like Facebook. Because the basement probably has a bunch of servers with all of the data and a, a flow for each feature. You know, one floor is groups, one floor is pictures, one floor is events. And you walk in and you, you know, look at some ads, leave some data behind, press, likes a, press like a couple of times and then leave the building. Whenever you want to use the system, you need to enter the building either for a website or the app or maybe, you know, whatever other apps that Facebook would build. Now, this is that's very, very different from the way plumbers walk. Because plumbers come to your house, knock on your door, um, fix your pipes, get money, and leave. So what that means is that uh, a plumber would authenticate into your data. You don't take your pipes and go into the plumber's building. So this idea of, of traveling utility is something I want to hold on to. Another thing that I'm, um, I'm speculating would happen um, is this idea that data and interfaces would merge. So you, it's very easy to think about, about the situation where if you um, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm looking at my desk right now. It's very easy to think about the situation where this desk would have some sort of a screen on it and a bunch of sensors. And the minute I put my phone on that, on that desk, a system would close and I could do something I couldn't do before. So this idea of, of merging computer models and computer views is another thing that uh, I suspect would happen. In his, uh, in his latest book, Kevin Kelly makes uh, the very plausible argument that uh, we'll soon have free cognition, uh, kind of similar to electricity or, or Amazon S3 services, where it's so exponentially cheaper that it's almost uh, free. So, so it's really interesting to consider if you can plug cognition into, um, into your database, what, what would you do with that? Because as I mentioned, data is uh, cheap, and building tools is becoming even cheaper. This is a picture, a screenshot of Facebook Learner, which is uh, a tool that Facebook employees can use to write machine learning algorithms using a graphic interface. So you can very easily fast forward or imagine a couple of years from now where we could start writing features just by typing them or even just speaking them into, a, into an IoT device. So to recap, 
I see the future of human machine communication as um, us passing the machine thick data in the right points, the machine and the machine rendering back uh, tools of utility. And we're going to experience what I've uh, been calling the convergence of language, this idea that a, um, the distance between a human mental model and a machine computational model would, would constantly converge. We're, we're going to get closer and closer with that. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks a lot, Nitsan. Um... I think for the for the um, for the online online audience watching now, we can we can jump into the the Q and A. We had uh, a few questions coming in already, um, so I'll jump in the first one. We have Eliza who asked, "Hi Nitsen, it seems that we will talk more and more with machines. How much will we have to retrain ourselves to do so?" That's a great question. So I'm actually I actually I'm doing some uh, linguistic work. Right now, with some people in Canada thinking exactly about that, about how, you know, how should we should we train ourselves? Should the machine train themselves? What's the right way of even communicating with machine on a language perspective? So that sentiment uh, is a result of systems not being properly designed to match human mental models. So the short answer is you don't need to train yourself at all. The machines need to be the design of the machines need to be better. So, so this this idea because we got um, fixated or, or carry around this legacy idea of an industrialist legacy, we think that we need to learn the tools. That's not the right way. It should be the other way around. The tools need to be matched with our um, with our mental models. I hope that answers the question. But I will say. Um, I will say that um, we shouldn't um, we shouldn't consider us trying to train the machines. Okay, Th thanks a lot um, for this answer. Um, we have a second question that came in. Um, it seems that, like you said, machines are going to get closer and closer to us. Going to merge with screens are going to merge with our tables. Uh, we might have chips coming under our skin. The utility will travel to us. So what about privacy? How can we ensure more privacy with m machines and technology coming closer and closer to us? Um, well, yeah, that's, a, that's a, another great question. I think, again, once you start monetizing um, utility and not data, right? So if you're, if you're thinking about the island, if you're thinking about that fence, you know, because we get all of those tools for free, in a way, any movement within that fence is owned by the company. Um, where you're not really thinking about privacy when you're calling a plumber, if that makes sense. So I want to go back to that plumber because the only thing uh, you're paying the plumber for is is their uh, service. You know, they're not monetizing your data; they're monetizing uh, the service they give you. Okay, um, we had another question coming in from Rashida. She said, can we really design machines to be like humans? Uh, what about emotions and feelings? I think in the beginning you mentioned this, um, machines are um, as computer science or as biology. So um, I think you said we can maybe uh, create new brains. Um, so, so how much can we really um, redesign machines? So. I see a lot of these emerging technologies. Like it definitely blends the line. And I actually wrote something about techno sobriety and techno religion, where people do think that machines are like humans. I'm very much in the in the opinion of augmentation as opposed to replacement. And definitely, um, I definitely agree or, or think about emotions and feelings. And that's something a lot of thinkers have been thinking about. So we should think about, about AI, for all purposes sake, as the most narrow version of automation or the most narrow version of utility. So that means that we're just going to build more and more small things that are automated, like calculators and hammers and train tracks, where the emotion and the thinking actually stays with the human. 
I think it's a, it's, it's a great segue, and uh, um, I would like to elaborate on this. So um, a lot of people talk about narrow artificial intelligence and, and what we call general um, or broader yeah. artificial intelligence. And, and I, I do think there is a, there is a lot of um, of cognitive dissonance when it, when it comes to when are we going to uh, achieve uh, general artificial intelligence, but also in terms of what it is about. So could you tell us more about this narrow artificial intelligence and, and what we call general artificial intelligence? Sure. So, so in a nutshell, the definitions are that a general is like the brain, a narrow, it just does one thing. I mean, if we just had to be like very explicit about that. So um, there's, a, there's a great book that I recommend reading, uh, which I'm going to cite right now by uh, Hawking, the person who started the Palm Pilot, called On Intelligence, in which he, he gives uh, three concrete reasons that the brain is not why the brain uh, is different from a computer, from a machine. Um, one, we take in feedback loops. We take in nine times the number of feedback loops back into our memory than, than, than what computes behavior. If you think about machines, machines all input computes behavior. That's the first difference. The second difference is swarm intelligence, the same way that bees fly together in clusters and birds, if you ever so on YouTube, birds flying together, the brain operates in a similar way, and the brain clusters together logic. Machines don't do any of that. Uh, there's some work around multilayer neural nets, but it's nothing similar to the complexity of the of the of the brain. Um, and thirdly, um, and almost most, and probably most importantly, the brain is phenomenally uh, uh, redundancy aware. That is to say, right now, machines that walk a lot faster than, uh, than the brain does. But a robot can't catch a ball, for example. Uh, the, the reason a robot can't catch a ball is because you don't sit there and calculate all of the sinus and geometry and calculus of, of the ball. You just catch it, right? So another way of thinking about it, I can probably put a bunch of apples on the table. Let's say, imagine that's like a thought experiment. Just like uh, uh, imagine a bunch of uh, apples on the table, you can put the most advanced machine vision algorithm that's going to go and get all of the statistics about fruits and where they come from and seeds and, and give you a bunch of like entries, but it could never talk about how the apples taste. So, this idea of multidimensional thinking, and you know, another way, if you want to kind of talk more social sciences or just design, it's just about thoughtfulness. So, so machines are, opera, are, are very good on the surface level. So you can think about narrow um, also in terms of that kind of surface level where humans would do this, this deeper, uh, would have that deeper understanding. So to that then, that's why I, I mentioned questioning before, the creative questioning, because the answers are going to be very easy. You know, you can think about it uh, almost like train tracks. Right, think about like train tracks. So all of those different skills would be train tracks, but we're gonna and they can run really fast, like you know, like the bullet trains, and they're probably gonna start flying in like enterprise level speeds, like in Star Trek. But that's still they're still stuck on the narrow domain, so they can't get off the rail. That's up to us to 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 connect those disparate um, disciplines. Cool. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot for the, for this answer, and I, I do think there is. Um, there's going to be a, a lot of work coming in the next years, and um, since there's going to be so much data coming in, to decide which data do we want also to to focus our attention on. I do think there is uh, time for a couple more questions, uh, so I'm going to take one from um, from Henry. He asked, "What kind of mindset do you think people need to be able to adopt artificial intelligence and to adopt this kind of new language that we need to have?" So I'll go back to the to the plumber example. And the reason I'm kind of bullish on that example is because, you know, that feeling we have where we stare at a tool and we don't know why we use it, and we kind of like, we feel like the system is trying to generate inertia from us, like the last time you were on Facebook and you're like, why am I getting this notification again? That's a reason of um, generating inertia in a gated um, system. That is to say, in a gated system, the system, uh, from a business perspective, needs you to, to retain you. That's like, that's like a product design 
UX term, retain your interest. Um, what I'm talking about, and back to the plumber, is this idea that if you build tools that give you what you need, then that doesn't require any, I mean, obviously it's gonna be a bit of learning, but by, by, by large, you're just gonna be living your life and you can we can kind of think about it like kind of a concierge following you around. It just you know it's not it's not one concierge for everything, but it's a concierge that does one thing. So a concierge for like to schedule your meetings, a concierge to read all of your blogs and give you a summary of all of the links, a concierge to look at your calendar and pick up on features that keep happening. And maybe like if you go to a restaurant every Sunday afternoon, then you would get like a postcard with like the best new restaurant or if you like you know so things like that that's probably actually and one more thing just to push on the concierge point um we also need to start thinking beyond platforms so platforms are like this idea that's a, a, a much bigger talk but this idea that there's one machine and a lot of humans interact with it so similar to uh, you know facebook again we use facebook a lot but when I'm talking about the plumbers, I want to start thinking about instantiation of the machine. So there's an instance of the machine. And you know, another way of thinking about it, that it's just a hyper contextualization. So this idea of one human to one machine is not very different than what I'm talking about with the plumber. So it's very, it's a similar uh, um, relationship. Um, thanks a lot, Nitsen. Um, I think it's it's all we have we have time for today. But I'd like to uh, to thank thank you to to have uh, given us this um, presentation today. Um, I personally really liked it because I think that too many people when they talk about artificial intelligence, they talk about the end of the world, the robots coming over. And I do think here there was a great uh, great thing to actually just take a step back and really uh, make the call for people to better understand how it really works. And personally, I got out of it that. Um, eventually, machines are gonna uh, gonna come closer to to the humans, but there is actually a way um, to redesign uh, the the communications and the language we have um, between each other to to develop better innovations actually in the future. Um, and I think it's a really nice segue into um, the next session that will come up uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, GMT on on thinkdeep.co on will automation uh, spell out uh, the end of the education system as we know it. So for the online audience, thanks a lot for watching today. Make sure we have a lot more content coming in in the next two weeks on thinkdiff.co. Um, ask all your questions on hashtag thinkdiff on the YouTube page or, or below, this, uh, below this video, and we'll make sure that we ask them, we answer them. Thanks a lot for watching, and thanks a lot, Nitsan, for being here today. Bye-bye. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you.